The history of Sheffield iron and steel making is dominated by well-known family companies such as Browns, Firths and Jessops. But we're going to look at a slightly less well-known company, Charles Camel & Co, which in the 19th century easily matched the others in size and reputation. The real spur to early 19th century iron making was the rapid spread of the railways, not just in Britain but also in the Empire, and particularly in the United States. From a standing start in 1830, Britain alone formed 7,000 miles of track in just 20 years. But as engines became faster and more powerful and rolling stock was expected to carry much heavier loads and at a greater speed, the ordinary wrought iron was too weak to cope. Rails, wheels, axles and springs failed, causing accidents, breakdowns, injuries and even fatalities. These load-bearing items needed to be made of a hard and more durable steel, but at that time it was difficult to produce steel in the industrial quantities needed and at reasonable cost. Steel is an alloy of roughly 98% iron and 2% carbon. Too little carbon leaves steel soft and weak. Too much carbon and it becomes too brittle to use. It's, it's a very fine balance. In the 19th century there were two basic ways to make steel. The first was to take rough pig iron that was full of impurities, heat it up in a fireproof vessel to around 1600 degrees centigrade and burn the impurities off. Benjamin Huntsman in the mid 1700s in Sheffield developed this age old process further producing good quality crucible steel and in satisfactory quantities for Sheffield's cutlery trade, but not enough 100 years later for the world's railways. The second way to make steel was to do the opposite, that is to take almost pure iron and then add carbon to it. This was called cementation. Thin bars of almost pure wrought iron, mainly imported from Sweden, were mixed with charcoal in airtight fireproof boxes and heated to red heat for days at a time. In the heat, the iron absorbs small amounts of carbon, making what is called blister steel, for obvious reasons, as you can see. Whilst this process took longer, it could accurately produce far greater quantities of good quality steel for casting and forging, without the need for such high temperatures. By the 1860s, there were 250 large conical cementation furnaces in Sheffield, capable of producing 80,000 tonnes of blister steel, you can see why later George Orwell complained Sheffield was the ugliest town in the old world, and that was only from what he could see through the smoke. But what about Charles Camel? How does he fit in all this? In 1830 he moved from Hull to Sheffield to further his career as a salesman and joined another famous Sheffield family firm, Ibbotson Brothers, at their Globe Works on Peniston Road. After seven years, he left to join two other brothers, Thomas and Henry Johnson, to form a steel and file manufacturers, Johnson, Camel & Co. on Furnival Street. That's just off today's Arundel Gate. But as the demand for iron and steel from the railways expanded dramatically, the company moved to Savile Street in 1845 on an 11-acre site which straddled the new Midland Railway lines into Sheffield allowing the easy movement of iron, steel and coal in and out of their factory. They called the factory the Cyclops Steelworks and originally employed 1,200 men making files, tools, special castings and forgings. Within a few years they became probably the largest supplier of railway springs, wheels, axles and other fittings in the world, especially to the United States as its railroads expanded across the continent and the US steel industry was still in its infancy. The works included a casting shop with its underfloor furnaces where higher grade steel castings were made from blister steel by reheating it to high temperatures in crucibles and then pouring it off into moulds. They also included rolling mills to produce all sizes and types of iron and steel plate, bars and rods. In 1851 camels even had their own stand at the Sheffield Court of the Crystal Palace exhibition in Hyde Park and later in 1854 when it was moved to Sydenham in Kent. Another major change came in the 1860s when camels began producing armour plating for the Royal Navy's men of war. Once the Admiralty was convinced that thick iron cladding would protect its wooden ships from enemy shell fire, demand was huge and by the 1870s armour plating became the largest part of camels output. 
By then they employed over 5,000 men in iron and steel works in Sheffield, Dromfield, Penistone, Grimesthorpe and Workington and had complete control over sources of the huge amounts of coal and pig iron they now needed rather than having to buy them in or import them from abroad. In 1879, Charles Camel, whose family home was Norton Hall and whose grounds later became our modern Graves Park, died in London. The company carried on in his name until 1903 when it joined up with Laird Brothers of Birkenhead, one of the first iron shipbuilders to form Camel Laird, which went on to build such classic ships such as the aircraft carrier Art Royal and the cruise liner Mauritania. Camel Laird still exists, but as the Royal Navy has got much smaller, so has the company. But Camels never lost touch with the railways. If you step into a carriage in the London or Glasgow underground, or in many overground trains in the UK and even around the world, you will probably see this sign on the floor plate as you go in but sadly not for much longer. The Metro Camel trade name disappeared in 1998. Before we finish, we can see why the company logo might be a camel, but why was the factory called the Cyclops Steelworks? Well, on top of the Sheffield Town Hall stands a statue of Vulcan, the Roman god of fire and metalworking. In Greek mythology, his name was Hephaestos, and in his subterranean forges, Hephaestus made the thunderbolts and weapons for all the gods on Olympus. And in this work, he was helped by three powerful one-eyed giants, and they were called the Cyclops. Anyway, that's all for now. Hopefully you found some of the video interesting, and thanks for watching.